A Brazilian man who'd been living with HIV for eight years has become the first person in the world to go into long-term remission from the virus after taking what's described as intensified multi-drug program. The patient has now gone more than a year after stopping the treatment and is still testing negative for HIV antibodies. Researchers have been quick to play down talk of a cure, but say it could be a historic point in the battle against HIV. This particular case study is important because it's the first time this has happened without the patient having a bone marrow transplant. Well, to talk more about this is the president of the International AIDS Society and chair of AIDS 2020, Dr. Anton Posniak. I'm also joined by Dr. Laura Waters, who's chair of the British HIV Association. Thank you both very much for joining us. And first of all, Dr. Posniak, we have been waiting for years for what's been described as the next revolution in treatment of HIV and AIDS. Is, is this it? Oh, well, it may be, but I think we ought to hold our horses a little bit until we've uh, followed this patient through for another six months to a year. It is possible that uh, he started therapy relatively early after being diagnosed, and we know that some of those people, even if they stop drugs, can go a long time without... Um, becoming positive again. Uh, and the interesting thing is, though, about this patient is that usually uh, your antibodies to HIV stay high, and he is starting to lose his. So it's very hopeful. But I wouldn't call it um, uh, the end of the story yet. But out of 10, how positive is this? Oh, I, I think we're over the five. So, yes, we're six or seven out of ten with this. Um, but we, we really need to be cautious. Do, Dr. Laura Waters, I, I saw you smiling there uh, when I asked that question. I mean, how significant do you think this is? Well, I agree with Anton. I was going to give it a six out of ten. Um, I think it's interesting. It's always hard to know whether it's any of the particular elements of the combination he was given. Uh, there was a vitamin... Um, in nicotinamide that was included and some people are saying that that might be associated with this seeming cure although again I hesitate to use the word cure quite yet uh, but I, I think it's of interest but I think it's important that certainly he's only one of 30 people in that study uh, and these cases remain very very rare. Um, and Dr Posniak, a, a drug which I will mispronounce, is it Cabotogravia? That, that is... is uh, Cabotegravir, yes, yeah, Cabotegravir. Now, now yeah. that, that, that's a game-changer because of how it's administered and the, and the regularity with which that's administered. Yes, so uh, recently, there's, uh, and we're going to hear more at the, uh, the AIDS conference, which is running this week, about a study called 083, where Cabotegravir was given uh, to men who have sex with men and transgender women, 4,500 of them, and it, and it was 69% more efficacious in preventing HIV than our current oral therapy. So that could be a real game changer for the world because you only have an injection every two months, whereas normally you'd have to take these preventative pills uh, either on demand or every single day. And, Laura, that's important because a lot of people who take those pills, and they have to take a lot of pills... Uh... Well, they, they tend to not, and that creates real problems, doesn't it? No, absolutely. And we know that, that for PrEP, for your HIV prevention, taking HIV drugs uh, for HIV negative people to reduce their risk of HIV, we know that high levels of adherence, so, so taking the pills as instructed, is really crucial. And clearly having an injection every two months will support taking that medication perhaps more easily for people who struggle to take the pills every day. It's really promising. It's really effective. This study was stopped early because the injectable treatment was so effective at prevention. But there's still some caveats, and I think obviously we'll hear some more this week. But it's really important to understand the people who did get HIV on the trial, although the numbers are small, whether they developed any resistance to the medication is one of the key questions, but it's definitely a very promising advance. Well, if I was a patient and I was listening to you now, I'd say, hang on a minute, I'm prepared to throw everything up in the air. I'll let, me, let me have it. Yeah, well, I, I can understand that. Uh, people who don't want to take pills and, and would prefer an injection every just turn up every two months, we have to make sure that we can deliver that. The other thing is, of course, that these injections are only the vanguard, the, the first developments in long-acting therapies for HIV. And I think in the, in the next few years, we'll see implants that may last up to a year or skin uh, patches like nicotine patches with HIV drugs in that could last many months. So I think we're at the, we're at the real edge now of major developments in HIV therapeutics.
Laura, this is a long time coming, isn't it? Because, well, we all remember the 80s and, and the, the tough messages there were about HIV. Is there a sense, that, and particularly with everybody now talking about COVID-19, that, that, that they, we're taking the eye off, of, off the ball here? Um, no, I mean, I think obviously an awful lot of services have been affected, you know, not just in the UK, but globally uh, with COVID-19. Um, I think many people work very hard to make sure that people with HIV have maintained access to their treatment. Work still is ongoing, as we've heard, into prevention. And actually, there's a lot that we can learn because COVID has accelerated modernization of services, embracing of telemedicine, delivery of medications to people's homes to minimize visits. And there's also a lot that COVID-19 responses can learn from HIV in terms of prevention messages and contact tracing. So I think although it's a very difficult time, ultimately we'll learn lessons from both of these epidemics that will benefit the other. Yeah, Anton, can I pick up on that? Is there a frustration that perhaps the focus is on COVID-19 at the moment? And that means money, much needed money for HIV research is being diverted. Yeah, money, money has been promised for, uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic. And really, you have to say it's quite appropriate that people have to focus on this at the moment. Uh, there have been disruptions in HIV services globally. So in countries where we're, we're sort of well organized and there's um, health systems that can cope with this, then we've done relatively well in supporting our HIV programs. But in others, for example, in South Africa, they've had problems with patients uh, not coming for blood tests, not picking up their pills uh, and other issues like this and being fearful for actually uh, thinking about going to a clinical hospital, uh, as many of us were, about going, going to any healthcare institute because of fear of catching COVID. And Laura, I can see you're in agreement with that. No, absolutely. And one of the presentations at the AIDS 2020 conference talked about the fear and the stigma around COVID-19 and people with, with chest symptoms. So particularly people with HIV who may have tuberculosis or other lung infections, not seeking help because of the stigma um, of, of COVID symptoms. So I think it's really important that we reassure people that we make sure services are accessible so we don't see negative outcomes because of this. But this is, what we're looking at at the moment, is good news. I mean, Dr. Do 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 Posnap, very briefly, this is, isn't it? Uh, the, the good, it's good news in terms of, we, we, I think we're, we're at a defining moment now about how we're going to deliver health care uh, because of the way that this pandemic's affected us. And I think we, we've got to be positive towards how we're going to uh, move towards integrating um, animal uh, our, our interaction with animals, our interaction with the environment, and our interaction with humans, so that our healthcare systems are robust if another pandemic arrives. So I, I think it's good news from that point of view. But in terms of the, the fallout, it's been predicted that maybe we'll have an excess deaths in the HIV population because of COVID of half a million. Half a million? Half a million, yes. Well, uh, it's obviously something we still need to... Uh... Uh, talk about yeah. regular and we have uh, perhaps that's the problem we, we've not talked about HIV and AIDS for a long time have we no it's it well <laughs> of course we well, do, you but, have uh, I know you have <laughs> <laughs> but I think that yeah and I, I think there are some great advocates for HIV uh, Prince Harry and Elton John and many many others have been trying to keep this on the agenda and especially HIV and young people where uh, many, many people uh, under the age of 25 are affected. So, yeah, I, I think that um, we need to keep our eye on the ball in the next five to 10 years because we're trying that by the aim is that by 2030, we can say that HIV is no longer an epidemic in the world. OK, quick final line from you, from you, Laura. Where are we on this? Well, I think the key thing I'd like to finish on is HIV services are most successful when they put the communities affected by and living with HIV at the centre and you get the people living with these conditions to help shape their services. The same applies to COVID-19. And I think if we do that, we can make sure the services are best suited to the future. Dr Laura Waters and Dr Anton Posniak, thank you both very much. Fascinating conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A teenager accused of murdering a police officer who died after being dragged by...